who live. Come to die. Picture this, it's 2011. The last Harry Potter film, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, was released to box offices nationwide. You, someone who grew up with the movies and novels, mourn the end of your childhood. The story of Harry Potter, the boy who lived, finally ends. Except you go home, open fanfiction.net, and read variations of its canon until 3 in the morning. It has been almost 10 years since Harry Potter officially ended, and a lot has happened to its canon since then. From the rise of Pottermore to the release of The Cursed Child, to even J.K. Rowling's unrelenting and unapologetic transphobia, the Harry Potter fandom has been through a lot of negotiation and canon retconning. And while the power of dictating canon normally lies in the hands of the creator, the number of Harry Potter fans who were disillusioned by J.K.R. have turned to, well, themselves. At least, that's how I view the resurgence of Harry Potter fanfiction on TikTok. Of course, fanfiction predates Harry Potter. Depending on what you consider as fanfiction, you could either trace it back to the Star Trek fanzines of the 50s or way back to the epic poet Homer. Though often looked down on by scholars and creators alike, fanfiction remains to be culturally relevant. Though it's been around for a long while, it became more accessible in the late 90s, early 2000s when the popular automated fanfiction website, fanfiction.net, started to boom. Fast forward to another decade and its hype still continues to live on. In fact, on February 15, 2014, the popular fanfiction website Archive of Our Own, more commonly known as AO3, hit its 1 million work mark, an impressive feat for a website that was created four years earlier. It also won a Hugo Award, a significant honor in the sci-fi or fantasy literature world, in 2019 as the year's best-related work. The award was big for fanfiction writers who were and are continuously being harassed by creators and corporate exploitation. AO3 was actually the largest and most popular project of the Organization of Transformative Works or the OTW, a non-profit organization run by fans defending fan works and their legal right to exist. According to an article by Vox writer Aha Romano, OTW and eventually AO3 were created amid a community uproar against FanLib. This company, FanLib, attempted to commodify fanfiction by asking writers to pay so they can be listed as distinguished work or paying very poorly for commissioned fanwork back in 2007. Because most of the production power is held by publishing companies, authors, and editors, it's not uncommon for fans to challenge the official creator when faced with unfair takedowns, lawsuits, and general exploitation. In relation to that, fan work can also be used to reject or rewrite the oppressive text and subtext of a specific work. Fan fiction is and always has been about reimagining a certain world as your own and claiming power over another person's work. When the hold of the fandom is strong enough, it can create facts that are great enough to overshadow the author's canon. This is often referred to as fanon or fan canon, a collection of ideas or concepts that are normally used in fan fiction. These are often universally agreed upon by fan creators and are considered as the default. Such examples of fanon in the Harry Potter universe would be Percy's whole name being Percival Weasley, when in fact his name is just Percy, or that Harry is a direct descendant of Godric Gryffindor, which was never confirmed by J.K. Rowling. These facts were written by the fans to fill in the gaps J.K. Rowling never filled when writing Harry Potter. Though this rarely happens, fanon can actually affect canon. The best example of this would be Hermione being black in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. What most people don't know is that before J.K. Rowling and Jack Thorne cast a black actress as Hermione, fans were already drawing Hermione as a black woman because of J.K. Rowling's ambiguous description of book Hermione. Just as a side note though, it's funny to me that J.K. Rowling never really addressed the fact that people drew and wrote Hermione as black in fanon due to the lack of bi POC representation in the main series. She claimed that she never wrote Hermione's race into the novel, even when it was mentioned in the book that Hermione had a white or pale face in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Anyway, my point is that the Harry Potter fandom is a very good example of fans exercising their right to critique and influence canon. There is, however, one thing the Harry Potter fandom cannot change and will have to contend with with the rest of their lives. Joanne Kathleen Rowling's unapologetic transphobia. 
Before anything else, I just want to say that I won't discuss this part in detail for several reasons. Number one, there are a million think pieces out there that break down her statements. I cannot add much to it. Number two, these statements could possibly trigger several of my viewers. And even if I do want to engage in the discourse and call her out, I do not want to exhaust them. And number three, I am not trans. For this section, I'll present you all with one irrefutable fact. JK Rowling is transphobic and is going out of her way to harm the trans community. The thing about fandom is that it's not unchanging. It constantly adapts, transforms, and migrates platforms. Which is why it's not surprising when earlier this year, in the middle of quarantine, TikTokers were found reliving their Harry Potter face through POVs, living Wattpad stories. So I'm going to assume that most of my audience here aren't a big fan of TikTok. I personally am. I don't make TikToks, but I scroll through the app constantly. For this reason, I'm going to list a bunch of TikTok terminologies that I may throw around here and there. If you're familiar with TikTok, feel free to skip this part of the video and jump to the timestamp currently on screen. FYP or For You page, the discovery page of TikTok. Unlike Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, this is where you'll spend most of their time. Not many people scroll through their following page because if you interact with the accounts you follow enough, it'll appear on your FYP anyway. POV's point of views. It's a chameleon genre of TikTok that is not specific to fandom TikTok, but is common enough in them. Traditionally, it's shot from a first-person point of view, where the viewer is the main character and they're having a conversation with the TikToker. However, some TikTokers just label most videos where they act as POVs, even if the viewer is no way involved in the story. YN or your name. It's a common term in character slash reader fanfiction where you just insert yourself in the character. Draco talk. Ah, the trend that started it all. Or rather, the most popular trend on Harry Potter TikTok. If I'm not mistaken, Harry Potter TikTok was popularized because of POVs featuring Draco. It has since expanded to feature other characters like Cedric, Fred, and Oliver Wood. But Draco talk was made quote unquote official by Tom Felton himself when he started commenting on the TikToks of his fans. He even created the Potter Challenge, encouraging others to mimic his own voice. Sounds. This may sound self-explanatory, but this is also a big part of TikTok. This is the audio in the video. You can either create your own audio or use another person's audio once they upload it as a sound. Now, since TikTok is fairly new, there aren't a whole lot of studies on it, or in particular, there aren't a whole lot of studies on fandom in TikTok. So I'm literally grasping at straws here trying to explain it academically in the way that I normally do. And I don't have enough resources, but I am going to try. As a side note, while I know that plenty of millennials have a hard time accepting TikTok as anything but cringe, I implore everyone to just keep an open mind. TikTok is a formative experience for many Gen Zers, and is in many ways the Tumblr of this new generation. That being said, back to the video. Fanfiction in general has always been a space of renegotiation. It exists to reject the status quo established by an author through its fanon and reclaims the text. It allows fans to exercise their own agency and creative independence when faced with facts they don't agree with. This is pretty much a universal occurrence, I explained it earlier, and it exists in every fandom for almost any kind of work. Now with JK Rowling being explicitly transphobic, Plus the fact that she hasn't released anything particularly interesting or good in the past 10 years or so, it's no surprise that Harry Potter fanfiction continues to grow and stay strong. It is after all number one, a childhood favorite for so many, and number two, problematic enough that people are willing to rewrite it to fix the story. And before anyone tries to defend J.K. Rowling in the comment section, let me very quickly run down all the things in the Potter universe that were signs of her very problematic thinking. Number one, the lack of trans representation in her novels. Number two, her treatment of Cho Chang, Fleur de la Cour, and Lavender Brown. Number three, the name Cho Chang in general. Number four, romanticizing Severus Snape, a Death Eater, and Nazi. Number five, the name of Albus Severus Potter. He was named after two gaslighters. Just. Number six, racial stereotypes and her magical creatures. Number seven, normalizing torture and corruption in Azkaban and the Ministry of Magic. Number eight, her reason behind not making Dean and Seamus canon. And well, number nine, the housing system, which while is fun, 
is kind of reflective of her own transphobia by abling and sorting children into neatly designed categories at such a young age. But anyway, this answers the various obvious question of why Harry Potter fiction is still strong. People make Harry Potter fanfiction to address these issues and create a world that doesn't pander to J.K. Rowling's whims. That being said, all of this doesn't answer the very important question of how. When J.K. Rowling was outed for being transphobic, a lot of former Potterheads, including myself, went into a personal crisis because of the idea of ethical consumption. Because even if we understand that what J.K. Rowling did was wrong, it becomes difficult to consume her work without feeling a little bit guilty. And creating work about the world itself is an issue. Are those talking about Harry Potter promoting J.K. Rowling unintentionally? Do these POVs or living fanfics help a transphobe earn more money? Or are we continuing to empower those who peddle out discrimination and tolerate transphobes? The truth is, there is no solid, clear cut way to address the transphobia in her work. One could argue about the separation of the art and the artist, but that becomes difficult when profit enters the picture. With the rise of Harry Potter on TikTok, more people are buying the books and watching the movies. And unless you're doing that illegally, which I'm totally not encouraging you to do, you are supporting her. That being said, it seems almost unfair to demand people to stop creating and consuming Harry Potter content. In a perfect world, J.K. Rowling's mistakes should be answered for by J.K. Rowling and her supporters and no one else. After all, Harry Potter has blossomed into something way bigger more than one woman's creative vision and imagination, having gone through four directors, numerous screenwriters, performers, producers, and the like. It has been picked apart, torn apart, and put back together by people who may have called her out. But at the same time, we can't deny that her work still reflects her own prejudice. Canon is canon. Canon is problematic. On TikTok, fans have been creative, at least, with this. As I mentioned multiple times, fanfiction renegotiates canon. Fanfiction on TikTok is no different. Wolfstar fanfiction, people writing characters fitting into all four houses, Draco Malfoy redemption arcs focusing more on smaller characters, the Golden Trio having Gen Z humor. Whatever you imagine happens on paper plays out in fanfiction videos through the use of sounds, cuts, and acting. You may be thinking, that's not really different from 2011 fanfiction then. I can tell you that it is. The added visuals, the dialogue, and the music make the experience more immersive. It's indicative of a new generation of Potterheads, one that has to live with JKR's transphobia at the height of their obsession. It's a generation that forcefully and unapologetically inserts themselves into the narrative. A lot of them say that this is theirs, and as a 23-year-old video essayist who had her Harry Potter phase way back in 2013, that fascinates me. If you've ever heard of Marshall McLuhan, you probably know his popular theory of the medium is the message, where what you say doesn't matter, it's how information is disseminated. The channels are what really matter here. However, I don't think a lot of people know that he once published a book called The Medium is a Massage or The Medium is the Massage. In an interview, he claimed that it was initially a typo that, to him, was a serendipitous one. The second word, massage, could be read two ways, as massage, the act of rubbing and kneading, or as mass age, an indication of where our civilization is currently at. And TikTok Potterheads are no longer just consumers of J.K. Rowling. Love or hate the medium, Harry Potter TikTok producers are, well, for the most part, critical producers. TikTok, of course, is a place of individual expression, though one could argue that fanfiction and AO3 or Tumblr also boost smaller content creators, it still lacks the very public and personal touch of TikTok. TikTok puts the creators front and center, so you can see different people, people who J.K. Rowling refused to write about in Hogwarts. Most people in my generation loved Harry Potter when the movies and the books were still being published. It was love for an actual piece of media created by a terrible person. However, Gen Z loves Harry Potter because of what they create based on the universe. They love it for what they made it to be. And they made it on TikTok. 
course, nothing is perfect. Though Harry Potter TikTok is a place where people can reimagine canon, it also endangers minors. Since TikTok is a platform that forces its creators to be at the center of their content, it also opens doors for exploitation and abuse. It troubles me that unlike my generation's years of exploration on Tumblr and AO3, TikTok fans are more vulnerable because they are so public. In 2013, you could have started a viral fandom Tumblr without anyone knowing your real name, age, sex, gender, or location. On TikTok, that's almost impossible. This becomes problematic when things like smut, violence, and M-rated POVs are produced and consumed by minors without supervision. At the same time, though plenty of creators aren't necessarily problematic, a lot of them have empowered and made excuses for J.K. Rowling and other Harry Potter actors. An example of which would be Tom Felton, who has still not spoken up against J.K. Rowling even after he was caught liking and unliking her transphobic tweets. Those who don't know any better continue to defend his inaction and passive violence and have helped him become more popular on TikTok. He's used this popularity to promote Harry Potter and has gone on record calling JK Rowling the genius behind the work. Which isn't necessarily wrong, but it's very tone deaf and offensive to a community he offended, especially since he hasn't apologized yet. But that's not really a TikTok specific problem as much as it is a fandom one. Herd mentality is still very much alive across platforms, and that's difficult when something as beloved as Harry Potter needs to be criticized and picked apart. 19 years later, and my attachment to this piece of fiction is still there. It's broken down, it's beaten, and it's not what it's used to be, but it's still there. And the only way I know how to process it is by acknowledging what was lost, how it was lost, and who caused that loss. And in my opinion, the first step is to grieve and admit to ourselves that something that we loved was created by a terrible person with terrible beliefs that reflect in the work. We're not necessarily ready to let it go, but we are ready to criticize and talk about it and not support her. There is one particular TikTok that inspired me to write this whole essay. It's by a man named Ash who cosplays as James Potter. James runs into a young boy in the corridors who's unable to go to the male dorms because Hogwarts magic didn't think he was a boy when he is. James helps him, his final lines echoing in my head. Listen, I love this castle, but some of the magics are still stuck in the Middle Ages. Let's not love this story blindly, because 19 years later, we're supposed to know better. Hello everyone and thank you for watching my video. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the support and a big shout out to all the TikTokers mentioned here. Be sure to give them a follow. If you like my content, please leave a like, comment below, and subscribe. And I will see you all next time. Bye!